program is on roadblock number eight, leaving money on the table. And this is designed to help you explore the question, what will clients actually pay you to do? Now, this is a really um, interesting uh, uh, session, I think, because I wonder how many of you have even thought about the full range of items you could be offering your clients for a fee. Um, and are, are, do you have those, those things ready to offer? Would you be surprised if they took advantage of it, et cetera? So, so let me tell you a little bit about what's going on with our uh, 2014 research. Right now, we've had some 207 uh, human development professionals fill it out. And one of the questions we ask them to rate themselves on is this one, activity number five, capturing all possible revenues from a given project or client. And for those of you who haven't participated in the research, you are looking at a change grid. We ask you to consider a particular uh, mission critical activity. And then we want you to answer four questions about that activity. Those four questions are, how big of a task do you think this is? How do you rate your ability to perform the activity? How challenging is it for you to perform the activity well? And how important is this activity in your overall business uh, strategy or overall thoughts? Well, based on the answers that you give to those questions, we can create a change grid for you personally. We can also, though, create a composite change grid of the entire population or any subset of that population. So what you're looking at here is all 207 human development professionals who have completed the 2014 change, uh, ChangeWorks profile here. So on capturing all possible revenues from a given project or client. Now, we can pull a lot of information out of this, and I will, but I want to call to your attention just a couple of things from the very beginning. Uh, first is that you're going to see two shapes, a triangle and a diamond. The triangle represents the average plotting for the entire population. So we took all their responses, averaged them out. This is where they end up. And this is the ideal location shown by the diamond. Uh, this is where we really want people to be. Now you'll notice that the shape is filled with a color. The, sh the color of the fill is a reflection of the importance rating. So the average person does consider this activity to be extremely important, and we want them to consider it important. So that's why the interior of both the triangle and the diamond are red. We don't think this should be that big of a task. We think this should be something that's very straightforward, very easy for people to do. And that's why we said it shouldn't be viewed all that big. And that's why the outline color is going to be green. Green is an indication that this is a small uh, activity, uh, but again, it has a red fill with high importance. Right now, the population thinks it's about an average size, moderate size kind of an activity, hence the yellow outline around it. Now you do see these circles scattered hither and yon. These circles represent um, a place on the change grid where one or more of the respondents plotted. So if you see the number one inside of it, one person among those 207 is sitting right there on the change grid. And when you see the numbers get bigger and bigger, more and more people plotted there. So here where you see me squiggling around, eight people plotted right there on the change grid and six are at the ideal location. And so we can take a look at the scatter pattern and understand a lot of what, about what's going on with the population. All that said, the thing that strikes me the most about this activity is the ratings that people gave for their perceived level of ability. Ability ranges from a low of zero to a high of 12. We'd like people to rate themselves as being a nice solid 10. I'm not looking for 11s, I'm not looking for 12s. We think that uh, the average uh, or the, anyone who's going to be in private practice should consider their ability to capture po revenues from a, uh, from a project or a client very high. And so we want everyone to be a 10 when it comes to having the ability to capture all possible revenues from a given project or client. I mean, you're in there anyway, and if you've convinced them to hire you for any particular activity at any particular price, then you know the real sell is already taken care of. What about all the additional stuff? that can add greater value to whatever the uh, engagement is that um, you've been hired to do. And so if we look at this particular uh, scatter pattern, a quick little tally shows that only 20 people or so uh, are scratched out. Only about 20% of the population, about 40 people total, have plotted their level of ability as being 10 or higher. That means a good 80% of our population is reporting a level of ability that is less 
than it should be in our opinion when it comes to capturing these revenues from a given project or client. We've got a, a one person who gave themselves a zero for ability to do that. A couple gave themselves ones. A few gave themselves twos. You know, now you start seeing the numbers come up a little bit, but our 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 uh, our population seems to be filled with people who do not view themselves as having a sufficient level of ability uh, to capture but uh, you know a, a reasonable pile of those ongoing revenues so we, we want to do something to to boost that ability uh, to to close that to uh, uh, capture those those revenues um, now people do view the challenge as being quite high and that's not a bad thing when the challenge is high, people actually end up being more engaged, and I'll show you a layer that describes that in just a second. So we're not so concerned about people rating their level of ability as being, you know, a 9, a 10, even an 11. I am a little bit concerned about a 12. 12 is supposed to be reserved for tasks that are impossible on the challenge scale. You know, there's just no way to do it. Well, if you're going to take this activity literally all possible revenues, then maybe that impossible rating would be fair. But that's not really the spirit of the question as we explained it to people. Just what is your ability to get it all? And uh, so uh, these 12s, we would probably say, are probably more realistically 11s there as well. So, so we, we don't mind people viewing the challenge as being a 10 or an 11. In fact, I'm concerned when people say the level of challenge is very low because they're saying that while my ability to do it is not very great, well, it's, it's less challenging than my ability shows. So what, why am I really worried about that? So that, that brings us cause for pause as well. All right, so anyway, you guys are looking at a ChangeWorks profile now. And so uh, let me just very briefly touch base again about you see a triangle. That is the average plotting. You see a diamond. That's the ideal location on the change grid. You see circles with numbers inside them representing um, members of the population who plotted there on the change grid. Uh, again, here on the bottom, you see the perceived level of ability ranging from a low of 0 to a high of 12. We'd like people to report themselves as a nice solid 10. The average individual is reporting their ability as being a 7, three full points lower than we want it to be. So this is most definitely um, an activity where the, uh, where the population, again, 207 people, a good, good representation of our, of our industry, are saying, I, I don't know how to do this. I really don't know how to do this. A lot of people are saying the challenge is also quite high. We like that. It is challenging to do it. And when people start to report the level of challenge being lower and lower, we start getting very concerned indeed. So uh, with that, let's go uh, ahead to a little bit more in-depth on, on uh, uh, what the change grid is showing here. Yay, you guys all have a graphic now. <laughs> So good. Um, we can also look at the level of productive tension. Again, uh, all of you are invited to go through the, uh, the change works training here, but you're going to learn about five levels of tension, stress, power, stress, power, power, apathy, and apathy. Stress is too much tension, generally speaking, for someone to be productive. Apathy is too little tension for someone to be maximally productive. We like them to be there in power, up there to power stress, where there is a, a sense of deliberate intentionality, there's a higher level of urgency around what's going on. And right now we got about half the population, 52.2% are actually plotting inside of power and another 22% up there in power stress. So generally speaking, there's a, a good level of tension that people have around this activity overall, but we do have a, a big pile of people that are losing that productive tension and maybe a few that have got too much to really focus on it. Um, the, uh, where you plot on the change grid also changes the energy that you have around doing a particular task. And so when we think about the energy that you have, we talk about four basic energies dating back to the 1920s. The driver energy is all about making something happen. The expressive energy is all about feeling what's going on. The amiable energy is all about caring. And the analytical energy is all about knowing. Well, we can take these energies and blend them together into the primary and secondary, even the tertiary sort of energy to really understand what is this person feeling in that internal environment? So what's going on inside of their, them energetically about this particular activity? 
And so when we think about doing the absolute best possible job of capturing all revenues from a given project or client, we know the energy that most naturally supports that is the driven driver energy. This is about going after this task with great determination, saying that I not only want to have some business with this client, I want to have all appropriate business with this client. And certainly, I don't want to go in there and sell them only a partial solution and then have them have a less than stellar result because of that. And so this activity is really all about making sure that anything and everything that would help that client to get the maximum positive benefit from working with you has at least been brought to their attention and hopefully has been put into that whole scope of work and you're able to quote on it, et cetera. So this is why we want people to be that driven driver, that we want them to feel that they have not done their job if they have not at least thought about and informed their client about the full range of upfront services, post services, you know, all sorts of things that we could do. And I'll give you guys at least a couple of dozen uh, things to think about when it comes to uh, services above and beyond the simple money you might be asking someone for. Well, right now, everyone is plotting on average as being an amiable driver. An amiable driver is a driver, so they do want to make things happen as far as this activity is concerned. But that amiable secondary energy turns them into more of a, of a caring sort of an approach. So they want to care their way into being of, uh, of service. So if, there, if there's going to be more money to be made, they're going to position it more like a suggestion to someone like, I, I'd love to support you. Here's something you might want to consider. So that amiable energy sounds much less tentative, or rather, sorry, much more tentative and much less direct than the driven driver energy feels around it. And so um, uh, I, I have no worries that the human development professionals that we certify are going to suddenly change from being caring, supportive individuals into being these, uh, you know, bulls in china shops. That, that's, that's not my fear. My fear is that the individual inside of their, their own thought process is hesitant to let their customers know that there are services available to them above and beyond the simple service they were hired for that would help them get even greater value and an even better um, result from doing that. So we got to get you guys uh, to change your mindset about this activity before we can begin to expect you to change your behavior around this activity. And I feel very strongly that if we don't bring these things to our clients, if we don't suggest to them that these would be of use to them, we are not helping that client to the degree we like to think we are. So if we're going to be tentative about making the suggestion, don't be at all surprised if they're tentative in taking whatever that suggestion may be. So I don't want to swing too far out, grid the driven, driven, driven driver. Uh, we don't want to do that. This individual right here plotting an ability of 12 or the challenge of a 12, all that they could come across pretty aggressively. We just want people to, to be fully committed to their clients. And that means fully committed to offering their clients insights and awareness about things they may not have realized they had to offer. Um, okay, and again, you guys are certainly welcome to type whatever questions or thoughts around this. Hap, ha, happy to do it, happy to do it. Um, okay, so let's take a, another little look at uh, a different layer, the change grid. This is the level of engagement people have around this activity. And so when it comes to capturing all possible revenues, we would like someone to be fully engaged, even executing. So let me just acquaint you with what the labels are on this layer, the change grid. Engagement has several different rings that we move through. We actually call them engagement rings, just for the little double entendre there, of course. But it makes it a little more interesting to remember. Uh, so when we think about someone being fully engaged in doing it to the, the task, they're actually executing it. They're finishing what was started. So way here on the outgrid side of things, over to the right, we call that direction outgrid. This is where we find execution. The person believes they have a high level of ability to perform this activity, and they view the challenge as being high enough that it's test time. They jump on board, they do it, they do it now. Um, execution is, a, is just an extreme level of engagement. So we uh, have a, the ring before execution, just say engagement. So this is kind of like the, you know, the routine level of engagement. We are actively doing those things necessary to support us in whatever this mission critical activity may be. And so we want people to be plotting in that engagement ring or that execution ring, but again, maybe not too far outward where things get to be a bit aggressive. Now engagement, 
is always preceded, and I do mean always, preceded by some sort of an intention. If you don't formulate an intention to do something, then how will you ever get around to doing it? And even if you never verbalize your intention, there's some internal drive, some internal intention to get it done, or you would never get around to doing it. And so we've got a whole lot of people that right now are in this intention band. In fact, the average individual uh, is saying, oh, I have an intention to capture all possible revenues. But having an intention to do it and getting engaged in doing it and ultimately executing on that activity are profoundly different things. So right now, because we've got so much of the population plotting to the left, which is to the in-grid side of things when it comes to this activity. Again, we want them to be here at this diamond. Draw a vertical line there and look at all the population <clears throat> pardon me, that is plotting you know, far over there to the uh, left side of things. We've got a lot of people that are hesitating to move forward. Maybe the root cause of that hesitation is the person feels unable to do something. We say that um, and if, as you guys, if you're new to us, if, as you work with us more and more, you're going to hear us talk about pride-based leadership and how we go about applying tension management principles to leading others. And one of the things that we want to know is what is at the root cause of this individual's failure, and that's in quotes. Um, so it doesn't have to be profound failure. It could be struggle, but whatever it is, what's at the root cause of it? And what we've discovered is that there are four uh, root causes. Those four root causes all begin with un. So they are either unaware of something that needs to be done or unaware of there's something about their situation. They could be unable to do something, lacking in the knowledge, the skill, the experience, the resource, whatever it is, so they're unable to do it. The third possibility is that they are unwilling to do it. In fact, they could be fully aware and fully able but still not feel like doing it. So they're just, they don't, they're, they're not willing, they don't feel like it. And then the last possibility is that the person is unsuitable. And as we talked about last week, or maybe it was the week before last, we were talking about why sometimes it's good for people to go into more of a contract coaching relationship or a contract trainer relationship because they aren't good at marketing themselves and they aren't good at selling themselves and they have no desire to get any better at it. If this is your personal truth, then let's not hide it or pretend that isn't the case. Let's just celebrate it and say perhaps when it comes to capturing all possible revenues from a given project or client, you're just not well suited to that particular task. So um, sometimes it's a, it's a suitability issue. So those are the four possibilities. Are you unaware, <clears throat> unable, unwilling, or unsuitable? And maybe it's a combination of those things. So when I look at this change grid, I definitely know that the majority of the people in this population are view themselves as being unable to do the job. I mean, they rated their ability as less than I wanted to, I wanted to see it. So they view themselves as having an ability issue. Now, maybe uh, there's also uh, a problem of awareness. They don't even know what's going else, uh, else going on with their client to be able to recommend something. So maybe there's an awareness issue. Now, because they're plotting further in grid, the further in grid you plot, the more conservative you become, maybe they are actually holding back, even recommending things that in their head they know their client needs. So I think there's a lot of, uh, and the grid would support this, that there are a lot of people in our population who are fully aware of other ways they could be of service to their customers, fully aware of ways they could boost the value, et cetera, you know, increase the outcome, all those wonderful, wonderful things, fully aware of it, but for some reason are hesitating to talk about it or hesitating to write it up as a scope of work so the clients can actually you know, evaluate it and make their own best decision. That hesitation is something that concerns me greatly. Okay, so now <clears throat> to finish off these bands, the intention is always preceded by some level of awareness. And these two bands you see up here at the top, hyper-awareness, then we have awareness kind of in the middle, hypo-awareness at the, at the bottom of things. Um, this gives us an opportunity to look at awareness when it uh, is uh, a positive sort of thing and when it becomes problematic. So let me just briefly give you a definition for hyper-awareness. And I'll do it by, um, uh, by way of an example. A hyper-awareness situation is when something happens that suddenly thrusts itself into your reality, captures all of your conscious attention, and puts you in an inescapable place. So, pardon me, 
if, for example, uh, one of your largest clients suddenly, without any explanation, discontinued using your services, and they represented a giant chunk of your billables uh, for, for this coming year, this would probably throw you very far upgrade into stress, uh, and you would be hyper aware about it. This is something that is so in your face, so in your mind, you can't escape it. And we've got a few people who are plotting up there that are totally stressed out and you know, be, being very much confronted by it. At the bottom of the grid, though, we find hypo-awareness. These are things that are flying underneath the radar. Uh, they've moved so far to the back burner of your mind, one wonders that they're even still on the stove. So hypo-awareness is when you wake up in the morning and you, uh, and you um, uh, open up one eye and you notice that there are raindrops on your window and you think to yourself, oh, it's raining. So you're aware of it. It's very low level. It didn't, you know, it's, it's in your, your reality, but it isn't exactly upsetting things in any way, shape, or form, uh, I guess, depending on what you plan on the day. So this is the idea. There are some things that are, we are so aware of, they're just in our face and we can't think about anything else. And uh, our level of tension, again, stress when we're up that far, uh, upgrade, uh, nature is saying to us, you've got to pay attention to this, where you've got things that are plotting at the bottom of the change grid, down where we find um, uh, power apathy and apathy for the levels of tension, and now things are starting to, to uh, run underneath that conscious awareness more and more as you plot further and further down grid. So, <clears throat> pardon me, the point is, we don't want our, our uh, our population to be filled with people who are tentative about this act of capturing possible revenues. I mean, yeah, I've phrased it that the revenues are important for you, but the services that you're providing are important for your client. <clears throat> so we want to do something to get uh, the population more engaged in doing that activity. And hopefully as we work our way through these sessions and building a career that matters, uh, you'll learn plenty of things that will help you move from awareness into intention, and from intention into engagement, and from engagement into full execution on this particular plan. So uh, that's a little glimpse into the tension management analysis of what's going on with everyone. And by, I put uh, some percentages down here as well, but we, we, we'll, we'll get into this more as, the, uh, as our weeks continue. Do you have any questions, comments about the change grids or what the, the data is showing about your peers and uh, colleagues? No? Okay, I'm glad you're finding it interesting. That's, that's great. Good, good, good. Okay, good. Um, let's see. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get into a little bit more about today's program. And that is, all right, what do, where are these missed veins of gold? Where are these additional sources of revenue that I could be tapping into? Well, what, what do I need to look at and think about in order to stop leaving so much money on the table? Well, it's different depending on which one of the four disciplines you've chosen to, uh, to, to uh, focus yourself on. So the speakers miss a lot of opportunities. So for example, they're, they're very content to receive a fee for their presentation. <clears throat> and you know, they'll get paid handsomely for that as we've talked about on other sessions. <clears throat> oh, allergy season. Um, but, and you know, maybe, maybe they're even doing some back of the room sales, you know, they got their products on their little product table kind of thing. Maybe they're content, content to do that. But rarely do you find a speaker who is ready to, or even interested in, providing the more in-depth training or reinforcement that the client may need to thoroughly implement what the speaker's advice was. So if I'm going to come to an audience and stand in front of them for an hour, exactly how much knowledge transfer can happen and how, what low level of skill development could possibly even occur in such a short amount of time. And so the speakers are not obligated to provide in-depth programs as follow-ups to that, but it is a source of revenue they could be tapping into if they would expand whatever their core content is or add some fun exercise or whatever. But, uh, but set that aside for a second. What about offering some sort of ongoing subscription service? so that the speaker can say, when I'm not in stage, I'm in front of my microphone, or I'm doing podcasts and webinars and all these sorts of things. And you can come to that either by subscribing for you know X amount per event or X amount per month or whatever, and turn it into a bit of a membership organization. So what are they doing up front or behind? Now, even in front of that presentation, are they hired to do the presentation, show up, deliver it, and leave? Or is there a possibility to say, before I come to you, I'd like to do a needs assessment. I want to make sure I understand what's going on with the audience. Or I want to make sure I'm talking to some of the key management uh, uh, people to really understand what they think the issues are that this uh, audience 
needs to be dealing with. So there's plenty of opportunity in advance of that presentation for there to be consulting work done, program customization work done, and that could affect a lot of things uh, besides the message that was being delivered. Maybe they want a whole new set of, uh, of slides for their PowerPoint and they want them all to be private labeled with the name of their organization. These are all things that over the years customers have asked for and they are things that you could bill for. But just for a second, let's say that even if you choose not to actually charge them for it, providing any of the services I've just rattled off for a, a compliment, as a complimentary sort of thing still has value. And so it's better for you to say, hey, here's a service that I'm going to give you, and I'm not going to charge you additional for it, but here's what the price would actually be. So they kind of know that, they, that you're not giving it away for the heck of it. You're giving away something of great value, and you're giving it away with purpose. So, <clears throat> pardon me, trainers have all sorts of things they could be doing because, you know, obviously there's all that upfront stuff we just talked about with needs assessments and um, doing uh, customization and all that. In fact, we have a list of some 12 different things that trainers can do in advance of a training program that would help them to increase their revenue stream. So uh, trainers can do that. But what about after the fact? What about the follow-up programs? Are you actually going to get people together again to make sure that they've had opportunity to apply the principles and have been playing with them, et cetera? Maybe that's going to be face-to-face. -face. Maybe that's going to be done uh, telephonically, or maybe that's going to be done um, you know, through some sort of technology. But where's the follow-up that needs to be done? Whereas the even reinforcement stuff, so even if you're not going to be doing follow-up programs, how about doing some sort of a uh, reinforcing article series or some weekly email everyone gets that just has a sentence or two of a reminder of what they they were uh, what was covered during that program. In fact, the speakers could do that and say, "Give me your." email address and I'll send you a weekly set of reminders so they're building their their uh, their database and they're doing something to constantly remind you of what it is you learn from them and how and why that could be very valuable for you to do so there's lots of things <clears throat> obviously the trainers can be doing uh, on that uh, in, you know the name of uh, veins of gold uh, coaches you know a, a lot of coaches we work with in fact I don't mind telling you the vast majority of the coaches that we work with um, <clears throat> uh, bill for the time they spend coaching the client, and that's it. One moment. <clears throat> Very sorry. If anyone has a cure for allergies, do let me know. Um, so the coaches tend to go like, all right, no, I, I'm selling them my time, and so I'm going to set up an appointment or, or a series of sessions, and that's what they're paying me for. And then they, they'll say, it's also fine for you to email me you know, if you've got a question, or if you've got a quick question you want to ask me, you, know, you can make a quick phone call. So they'll throw in some of those little additional services. But there are so many other ways the coaches could be making money. Maybe it's about uh, doing some assessments up front, you know, whether you guys are doing personality tests, value inventories, whatever it is you might be doing. That can be another source of um, revenue for you. Uh, those of you that are using the change grid, well, you could be doing a, um, uh, a, a monthly change grid with that coaching client that just says, what are all the things that you want to be working on? Let's see how ready you are to do those things. Uh, so let's see what the change grid tells us about your um, likelihood of success and what we need to do in order to help keep you on track for doing all the things you really want to do. And then you can, um, you know, uh, do a, uh, a repeat of that activity list uh, a month later. You can show progress on it. So there's no reason why you couldn't charge someone for that, um, for that, that change works uh, uh, profile being integrated into the coaching work that's being done. Um, so you can do that. Another thing that you can certainly do is uh, expand your offerings from instead of just doing lots of one-on-one -on -one stuff, maybe you can say uh, that you also offer some group coaching opportunities that could be uh, uh, limited to a particular client. So after they finish doing their direct coaching for ongoing coaching reinforcement, maybe they could participate in your group coaching or maybe they too could become a member of your organization or your subscription services. Um, coaches could also be writing books not only about the kind of coaching they do and the population they do it for, but maybe they could also be writing about uh, their techniques themselves and now kind of parlay their own success as a coach to helping other coaches become even more successful.
So there's lots of things that coaches could be doing. And certainly consultants, um, while they have, they have a, the most challenging time of the four different disciplines when it comes to those ongoing services, uh, there's still things they could be doing. Like we want to know, uh, uh, a lot of times consultants will go in. They always charge an hourly rate for their time. That's really great. But um, they too could be using lots of instrumentation. They too could be looking for opportunities to speak before the group or to do some sort of little training or coaching. So they may go in there with their uh, primary focus, uh, the consulting project, but every project gives rise to other work that could be done. So the bottom line is very simple. There is always something more that a client might view as valuable and worth paying for. If, it, if you were to give that thing away, if you were to give away that thing that the client would view as valuable and worth paying for, what you've just done is spent your profits because the client would have paid for them. So as you sweeten the deal, you never want to give away what you could have sold. Um, for example, you get hired to do a two-hour program, but you charge a full daily fee. Um, now, the reason why, again, for those of you that are, that are working as speakers or trainers, if they're going to hire you to do an hour-long keynote or a couple-hour breakout or even a half-day program, the bottom line truth is that it's going to take you the whole day. And so when it comes to how I, I charge my clients, and we'll get into this next week on how to actually price yourself, but um, unless you are a piece of business that I can drive to in 30 minutes or less, I am going to charge you for a full day of my time. Because by the time I get to you, do the thing, and come home, my day is shot. And so uh, we can certainly, um, um, you know, we don't want to give away the whole thing. So if you're going to hire me for a two-hour program, I'm going to charge you a full daily fee regardless if I've got to be traveling for more than 30 minutes. And, uh, and then, um, <clears throat> it, you know, a lot of people will be throwing in training materials, throw in the workbooks, um, instead of offering to use your time a bit more creatively. You know, so, so you just want to really th think about this, or never forget this. Everything you're going to do uh, in front of, during, or after, you provide whatever that service is you actually sold, in air quotes, you actually sold to them, um, are value-added items that could certainly, if nothing else, increase the perceived value of what you're charging. That might allow you to raise your price. Or these are things that you could charge for separately to boost it. Um, so, but if you ever do choose to include some of these additional services at no additional charge, make sure that the client at least sees that there was some real value that you were providing among those. All right, so with that, let's uh, get into some other things. Now, I've been talking a bit about this, but, uh, but let, let's just kind of get into a bunch of them. I've kind of rattled a lot of this off. Um, so some pre-event. And by event, I could mean your coaching session. I could mean the delivery of your speaking engagement, whatever that thing is that they hired you to do. Uh, there's lots of opportunities. So customization is, a, is the, the, the big one. Um, and, but you can't customize until you've done a needs assessment. And so do you have a needs assessment tool? Now, as we work our way through building a career that matters, we'll spend a whole session just on the subject of needs assessment. But whether you are talking to a coaching client, a, a training client, whatever it is, you should begin by doing some sort of a needs assessment. That needs assessment could be purely conversational. You just take them through a series of questions uh, and, um, and uh, you know, what, based on their answers, you decide how you might want to modify whatever it is you're going to be doing for them. Or you could do a very uh, thorough and formal needs assessment. And there are you know, certainly many of those that are out there on the marketplace. But, um, but the, the, one way or another, doing that needs assessment is going to accomplish two things. The first thing it's going to accomplish is that it's going to bring to your attention what your opportunity is to be of service to the client. But perhaps even more importantly, it's going to bring to your client's attention what they actually need. And so even if you believe you already know exactly what your client needs, do not um, assume for one moment that the client understands the full scope of what's necessary. So performing a needs assessment, is, it's attention management technique, obviously. It's bringing focus to issues that need to have some focus placed upon them. And so whatever, however you do that needs assessment, great, you can do that. Those of you that are change work certified, you, know, you already know how to use a change grid for your needs assessment. But there are lots of different ways you can go about um, bringing forth that, uh, that client set of needs and bringing them to the client attention as well as providing you with the information you need uh, to customize the program. Now uh, customization I think applies to everything. Um, so 
when it comes to delivering a program, uh, I, I include standard customization on all my programs. So here's what I do. So included in the sta standard fee, so if I'm going to charge you $5,000 to do a program for you of one day or less, I'm going to include in that price one hour of basic program customization. Generally, that means I'm going to talk to the uh, you know the key manager, key player, whoever, for 30 minutes, and it means I'm going to spend maybe uh, 30 minutes reviewing whatever their training materials are, marketing materials are. 30 minutes of reviewing my PowerPoint presentation, so I'm getting things ready. Anything that takes more than than that hour total, um, I'm going to charge them for, and I'm going to charge them my standard consulting fee for that. So um, now we get into something like uh, executive consultation. A great deal can be learned from simple conversations with the leadership team of an organization. So to that end, we conduct a series of teleconferences or physical meetings with key executives and any of their colleagues that he or she wishes to include. These discussions are held at specific points throughout the training program. So sometimes I'm going to do them up front, but I might also want to include executive consultation at other times during this whole uh, process. So maybe a midway point, a post point. Um, some of the coaches that we uh, deal with are doing in-house um, corporate uh, management and executive coaching. And part of the deal is that uh, they will inform the senior leadership team of the effectiveness of their coaching as they work on it. They do not necessarily divulge anything that was private, and I'm sure they've come up with whatever agreements that everyone's most comfortable with as they build the relationship. But nevertheless, the executive is going to uh, want some sort of proof that the investment they've made in that coaching was worthwhile. So whether the um, the way you're doing that is just by getting satisfaction scores from people. So uh, maybe on a monthly basis you ask each of your coaches to simply rate the value they feel they're getting from the coaching experience, the value they see in continuing it, whatever your little list of questions is. It's good to be able to get together with the executives and say, here are how, here are how things are progressing and here's what I think we need to be doing going forward. Now, you can think you should just give that kind of executive feedback for free. I disagree with that. There is time that it takes for you to do it. You should let them know that there's three hours, uh, like a pre, a, a mid, and a post um, a series uh, executive consultation that you're going to have. You charge $500 for each of those consultations or $1,000 for each, whatever you really want, uh, and just let them know that. So if you do choose to include it for whatever reason, at least you've talked about the, that there is actual value in, in providing that. Um, the, another thing that you can be doing, and maybe not so much for the coaches, but certainly for the consultants, the trainers, even the speakers, this is about doing an internal trend analysis. An internal trend analysis is a survey that you put together. Uh, it, you could use many different styles. So it could be a survey monkey kind of thing. It could just be an interview. It could be a uh, focus group. But basically, you're trying to identify whatever the existing and imminent trends are within that organization. And based on the information that you get, uh, you can then put together uh, the uh, you know a program or uh, a, a coaching uh, solution that you think will really very directly address whatever their needs happen to be. Um, more and more we're hearing about uh, coaches doing some sort of needs assessment, doing a trend analysis so they can say that yes, it's true that the following people will benefit from one-on-one -on -one coaching, X number of sessions spread out X number of time. We want this group of people to be participating in weekly group coaching, and we want um, uh, this one particular individual to be selected out for some sort of 360 sort of a sort of uh, of a uh, of an experience. And so, <clears throat> through that customization, trend analysis, etc., you can come up with a great deal of insights that you can use to support your case for um, the client engaging you for those services as well. Um, there's also an external trend analysis. So an external trend analysis is just another survey, but rather than asking questions of the employees, you are instead asking questions of the customers or the suppliers, the people who are outside of the organization to see how uh, things are getting along there as well. Now, again, when it comes to these trend analyses, you can get paid for creating the analysis, for conducting it, compiling the data, uh, developing a report, delivering that report. Um, there are a lot of billable opportunities that come along with doing an internal and external trend analysis. 
But the other thing I want to chime in as we go through this <clears throat> is that every time you do any of these things I'm talking about, you are probably distinguishing yourself from your uh, fellow um, uh, pro colleagues as well. I mean, you guys view yourselves as being colleagues, but many times you're also going to find yourself being competitors. And hopefully in a competitive situation, you would like to win. And in order to win, you need to distinguish yourself, differentiate yourself. And all of these different uh, services that we talk about are not only uh, additional revenue sources for you, but they are uh, differentiators and uh, they're certainly added value if you choose to include any of these things without increasing your fees. <coughs> Pardon me. And thank you, Patrick, for the, for the uh, suggestion. Herbal tea and a lemon. I'll give it a try, I think. Um, okay. Ah, now, the um, next thing, competitive analysis. This is probably going to be more for those of you that are consultants and trainers. But it's wonderful to know a lot about the company itself. And it's fine to know from the external trend analysis what's going on outside of it. But perhaps uh, it's best to sum it up this way. All competitors have their strengths and weaknesses. But perhaps the greatest weakness of all is not knowing what your competitor's strengths and weaknesses are. So in this particular kind of an analysis, you are putting together a survey that sets a series of benchmarks and assesses each competitor against those standards. Now, this is a good thing to offer your clients to uh, help them to have the program that's really going to make a difference for them. But I would suggest that all of you should probably do your own competitive analysis in your own businesses. So uh, not all coaches are created the same. Not all trainers are created the same. In what way can you differentiate yourself? And we'll be talking about grand differentiators as, again as the... Uh, as this course goes on. But competitive analysis also applies internally. Certainly, you could be doing a ChangeWorks profile um, to really understand what's going on with the mission critical activities that were revealed during the needs assessment and during the trend analysis. So you could do that as well. But beyond that, we've got things like uh, a job audit could be done, so you're going to come in and observe people doing their work, or you're going to review whatever their documents happen to be. Um, sometimes I've been asked to serve as a secret shopper, so before anyone meets me, I'm going to come in there as a customer, potential customer or a real customer, and I'm going to evaluate your actual performance. We do that at trade shows all the time. In fact, when we get to the topic on secrets of trade show selling, I'm going to be encouraging guys, guys to do uh, a little thing we call uh, a, a secret shopper job audit at trade shows. You're evaluating other people's effectiveness and uh, could open up some real doors for you there. We can also be reviewing people's marketing materials. Uh, we could be um, looking at the, whatever uh, collateral materials they might be using, uh, all sorts of things that could be, be done for that. So um, now, if you really want to take customization to its greatest level, you may be developing unique content for a client. Just take the warnings we gave uh, last week, the week before that, about leveraging things. You, you don't want to get in the business of creating something unique for every single client that you can't then reuse or modify and reuse with another other client down the road. So lots of things you can be doing there. Uh, uh, you can also repair their materials, like for example, because we talk extensively about tension management. Maybe I'm coaching an executive on how to package and present a message to their followers. And uh, I listened to what they have to say, or maybe I've even audited them. I went and heard one of their presentations before they uh, kind of uh, knew that I would be working with them. Um, so. Um, you know, I've heard them do their thing. I can do attention analysis of what they've done. I can actually draw like an EKG machine. What's happening to the audience's levels of tension? When is it going up? When's it going down? Where did they start it? Where did you move them to? And then we can go in and repair that message. And so this allows us to help that person uh, polish up their messages, make them more compelling in a way that is uh, uh, deliverable either orally or it could be done in writing, could be something that's more permanent up on their website, something like that. So there's a lot of things that you could be doing to help your clients above and beyond the uh, session you happen to be giving them in the moment. Um, let's see, we've got just a few minutes left. Anyone have any questions, comments? Hopefully you're finding this interesting. Haven't lost anybody. That's always a good sign. Um, all right, a couple more things to look at. Now, uh, here's some just things I, I want to throw on if you guys are doing any kinds of a program. And by the way, even uh, those of you who are uh, coaches, you might not think you've got any occasion or any reason to go out there and do a program, but even if you did it in the name of community outreach, 
there are some wonderful things that you have available to you uh, to help you help the community you care so much about and attract them into your um, into your fold as well. If nothing else, and uh, I don't know which category this flies into, it's probably in a, in a different program, but um, many of you know that um, my wife and I go on a lot of cruises. What you may not know is that the cruises we go on, we go on for free. And we go on them for free because <clears throat> we've uh, identified a couple of agencies that we could work with who are in the business of placing human development professionals on cruise ships as an extension of their um, of their uh, uh, kind of a cruise team, you know, the, the activity coordinators, things like that. Um, so we don't get paid to go on these things, but we're basically getting a free vacation. And uh, as long as we do an hour or two's worth of work over the course of a week-long cruise, they give us a, a passenger uh, stateroom, and, uh, and it's all, all very, very, very pleasant. So um, if, if you did nothing else as a coach, you've got to ask yourself the question, would you be able to come up with two one-hour uh, sessions that the general cruising population might find interesting um, that would also maybe open some doors for you. Like, could you talk about relationships for an hour? Could you talk about personality for an hour? Could you talk about leading other people for an hour? Could you talk about self-coaching for an hour? The answer is, of course you could. And cruise lines would be more than happy to put you up there as part of their uh, they're, uh, and they call us life enrichment lecturers. So you could become part of their life enrichment team and go on cruises whenever you really want to. Now, if you do want to participate in such a thing, the agencies are national, and they only will talk to you if you've been recommended by one of the existing people they use. That's what we're finding out. And so if you guys would find that interesting, just give us a, um, a, a little uh, email, and we'll be happy to, to point you to them. If you want to know, the, the, one of the biggest ones is now Six Star Entertainment. And you can look them up online. But uh, you could go through online putting in all of your data, and you may never hear from them. But the moment they get a call from uh, one of the existing uh, providers, you go like, oh, I've got this great person. You really should talk to them. Uh, that's it. Now, I will tell you that if you're going to ask me to make that, that attachment for you, then you got to know that they're going to want to know, do you have three or four topics that you can present? And they're going to ask you to provide a little paragraph. I'm not going to contact them on your behalf until I know you're ready to impress them because I don't want them to think I send them ill-prepared people. And so if this is something you find interesting, maybe we can talk about it on another call or whatever. But uh, there's some work you'd have to do up front if you want us to be uh, supporting you going into it. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, with that, let me just kind of, uh, we've already talked about these things. I just didn't follow my little bullet points. Uh, but let's talk about next week's topic. Next week, we're going to be talking about roadblock number nine, not getting paid what you're worth. And the key question here is, how should I price my services?